All right, good morning, church. We're so glad that you guys are here worshiping with us. Um, let's go ahead and, and worship God together. Come on.
Good morning, church. For those uh, of you gathering online right now, my name is David Lesner. I want to welcome you to worship here at Creekwood United Methodist Church, where we are growing deep roots to share God's love. And know that we actually have some friends in the audience with us today, live in the room where it happens, who gets to see where the sausage gets made. Uh, because this, uh, this morning's musical that we are theming in our Beatitudes on Broadway sermon series uh, is Hamilton. And we plan this around the 4th of July because of the celebration of the founding of our country that the musical represents, as well as the challenge that it offers us about our country uh, today. And the preamble to the Constitution and what I find in Hamilton is the value of the people and what the people do. So we're having a We the People Sunday here today where several of our lay leaders are in, uh, and students are helping us to lead worship. So you'll see some familiar faces as we prepare also to uh, gather uh, for a limited number of in-person worship participants next week. And again, you'll see that RSVP link and that information on Wednesday. It'll come out on the website and in my Deep Thoughts email. But I want to welcome you to our Hamilton-themed worship. And, and just for some reference, we actually planned this back in like November or January. So thank you to Disney for releasing Hamilton just for us um, so that we could get a little bit of a marketing boost and make it more relevant. So we hope you maybe got a chance to check out Hamilton, but uh, in the theme of uh, not throwing away our shot, let's take the opportunity we have to worship a God who is so good um, as we sing about all the reasons why God is so great for us. Let's sing again.
Merciful and loving God, we ask you to hear our prayers as we lift up our concern for those who are suffering and in need of hope. We pray, Lord, for your steady hand to ease the fear in our world and help us follow the light of Christ in the darkness. We pray, Lord, for your wisdom to be both with both our leaders and ourselves as we navigate interruptions to what we have known as normal. We pray, Lord, for your healing touch to be with all whom are sick, nervous, lonely, and in need of rest. Please grant us the humility to see what we cannot see and the wisdom to do what is right. God, bring us together in one heart of forgiveness because we have seen what powerful things can happen when your body unites in Christ. We have seen the spirit surge when your people have humbled themselves, and we have seen the healing happen across all sorts of boundary lines. We thank you for those who have paved the way for us to freely live into your spirit, and we pray that you might too leave a legacy of progress towards a world that looks more like your kingdom than our own. It is our faith that leads us to pray and our confidence in your promises that inspires us to pray the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
on my way to being to be to train for the SEA agent. And I believe that my submarine has broken down. And I just I, I think I have to pull out my manual. I think this manual might be to be an SEA agent. I think it's the plan for VBS this week. Day one, people can help my faith grow. Day two, my faith grows deeper when I use my gifts. Day three, my gifts grow deeper when I spend my time with God. Day four, my faith grows deeper when I share my story. And this week, you can learn all about that in VBS. Um, it's virtual, so come pick up your bags so that you can have an awesome time online and just have a good time. Um, I'm gonna pray really quick. Uh, please bow your head with me. Dear Lord, thank you so much for bringing us together and let us have a rockin' time at VBS this week. Um, don't, we, we love you and I, th I hope we have a great time, amen. Um, don't forget, you can come pick up your bags from 12 to one today. Uh, you'll see Miss Allison and I, so come say hi. Uh, don't be shy. That rhymed. Um, have a great week. Hi, good morning, Creekwood. I'm, I'm so excited to be here and bring you announcements this morning that I, I put on pants for the first time in three months. It was, e it was even more exciting that they still fit. We have uh, four announcements here for you this morning. Uh, first, as Michaela just mentioned, in the spirit of Hamilton, she even rhymed it out, uh, virtual VBS starts tomorrow. And if you need to pick up your bag, uh, Miss Allison will be here from 12 to one at the East door and you can get those. Second, we have for July the second installment of Family Missions going. And this is a great opportunity for you and your family to do some mission work and spend some time together uh, in a socially responsible way. You can contact Ms. Katrina for more information about that. Third, uh, July is also the second installment of the Amazing Grace Race. And this is a chance for families to do scavenger hunts and other fun family activities and earn points while you're doing that. The winning family for July, who gets the most points, will get dinner brought to them. And we're super excited to congratulate the Wilbur family, who is the winner for June. Congratulations, Wilbur's. And you can contact Ms. Donna for more information on that. And then fourth and finally, we have our next installment of the Food Trucks for Feeding Allen. It's gonna be next Tuesday, the 14th. And that will be Muya. So sign up on our website, creekwoodumc.org slash food truck, and you can be in for Muya. And now Ms. Kendall's gonna bring us the scripture. Oh, never mind. I'm usually the one that forgets offering time, but I'm, so I'm thankful it was somebody else today. But uh, we're gonna take this time to uh, collect this morning's offering. If you're worshiping with us online, you can go online to creekwoodumc.org slash give. And uh, you'll find the link there to give. You can use the mobile phone app or the text to give app. Uh, as uh, we've sent out by email in the past, it, all that information is on the website as well. If you're here with us uh, in worship, we'll have plates for you as you leave here today. So we're not passing things because I want to remind people at home that everyone in here has a mask on when they're not on stage. And we're wiping down the microphone and trying to make sure that we uh, maintain all of the uh, responsible things to do no harm in this world. Now, uh, one of the other, the, that's the first general rule of United Methodist Church is do no harm. The second is do good. And every time that we take communion, which we will later, if you don't have your solid and your liquid ready to go, uh, when we take communion, uh, we take an offering that is our hands and feet offering as we become the body of Christ to uh, do the hands and feet work of Jesus in the world. And so we're going to take a communion offering uh, this morning for Harper Helper. Uh, they have a special initiative coming up. We hope to be back in the school with them uh, when it's safe to do so, but they have a special initiative um, that 
uh, our Carrie Lynn and our new uh, head of Harper Helper Ministries, Casey McCulloch, are going to tell you about in this video. Good morning, Creekwood. Good morning, Creekwood. I hope that you all are enjoying your time in worship this morning. I'm so, I'm so, 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 so proud of the ways in which you all have continued to engage in mission during this pandemic. We have been able, because of your generosity, to help out so many great missions projects like ACO and our sister church in Honduras, and we've got another challenge for you all. Normally, we have our Harper apple tree this time of year, and I am so excited to introduce to you Casey McCulloch, who is our new Harper chair on the missions board, to tell you how we're going to do the apple tree this year. Hi, Creekwood. I'm Casey McCulloch, and this year I have the privilege of stepping into my new role as chair of Harper's Helpers. As you may know, the goal of our missions team at Creekwood is to empower those who we've partnered with in reaching their goals. Principal Eastep is beginning her inaugural year at Harper with the awesome goal for her students to collectively read 1 million pages, both at school and at home with their families. In talking with Principal Eastep, we discovered that many Harper students live in homes in which the primary language spoken is Spanish, but Harper doesn't have enough Spanish books for all these students to enjoy reading with their families. Research tells us that reading aloud to your child is the single most important activity for building knowledge and for their eventual success in reading. It strengthens their bond with their parent. It builds emotional, social, and character development. It is just so important for these students. So with your support, we can empower Harper Elementary in this very important work and purchase plenty of high interest books in Spanish and let every student in that building know that they are important and worthy and loved by our Creekwood community. So you might say that one of the roles of the church in proclaiming the love of Christ is to get everyone on the same page. And so we are hoping to help get the Harper students and their parents as well on the same page through their million page effort. Uh, if you'd like to give to that, so you go to creekwoodumc.org slash give, and there's actually a scroll down thing you can click on. It usually says operation budget or general budget. And you can scroll down and do mission giving uh, for that. If you want to participate in that offering, you can do it from your phone, you can do it from your computer, or if you're here again in worship, we'll uh, take plates at the end, uh, or we'll have plates at the door at the end. And so um, with that, let me pray over our offering, and then Kendall will come read our scripture for us. Let me pray. Good and gracious God, well, thank you for the love that you have for us and the way that that love breaks down barriers, barriers of borders, barriers of personalities, barriers of all sorts that allow us to take the stage together and put on a beautiful display of, of what this world can look like. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to uh, help get Harper Helper kids on the same page. We thank you that we have the same responsibility and the same mission and the same privilege of helping get the human race on the same page. Lord, as we are in your presence where it happens, help us to not throw away our opportunity, our shot to uh, bring this world closer together in love and grace, the way that your son taught us to do so, the way that your son helped us to do so, and ultimately the way in which he joined with those who are mourning and suffering by dying on the cross. Lord, as we lay down our offerings, help it to be a sacrifice that puts us on the same page with each other and on the same page with what you are doing in the world so that we might join your mighty efforts to make this world look more like your kingdom than our own. And it's in your son's name that we pray this and we give. Amen. Um, I'm going to read Matthew 5, 4 and Galatians 6, 2. Um, my, Matthew 5, 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And Galatians 6, 2 says, um, Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Make sure that's still there. All right, now I can see. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean McCafferty. I'm the chair of the Creekwood Lay Leadership Committee. And on occasion, uh, David has asked me in the past to 
give the message when he's either on vacation or going to a conference or playing hooky or whatever the excuse, it doesn't matter. He's asked me uh, on occasion to step in uh, and I'm always deeply honored because the ability to give the message not only uh, gives me an opportunity to talk to you but also helps me uh, do a really come to terms with the sort of the stirrings in my soul about what the, the message says. Uh, David asked me to do this sermon way back in January uh, of this year, January 15th. I went and looked it up actually as we were planning out the messages for the year and that seems like several lifetimes ago. Uh, I certainly didn't plan on giving the sermon during a pandemic or uh, live streamed over the internet. But I'm grateful for the opportunity, particularly grateful for David because I know how much he loves uh, Hamilton, the musical, uh, that he would uh, turn over the reins for a Sunday morning to me on this. I also love the musical Hamilton. Uh, I think it's an excellent musical, and I think there's a really unique and interesting way it interacts with the Beatitudes. As many of you know, we're working through a, a sermon series called uh, Broadway and the ba Beatitudes, which discusses Jesus Christ's Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount uh, in the context of the great American Broadway musicals. And today, uh, as Kendall just read, we're talking about, in particular, the beatitude, blessed are those who mourn. At the outset, I, I wanna frame today's discussion a little bit uh, because it, I think it's different in both kind and approach from what we have taken uh, so far to date in this. So far, David and Carrie Lynn, when they've preached on the musicals, have taken the character line or the plot line in particular of that musical and then related it to whatever particular beatitude they happen to be talking about that weekend. So, so for instance, last week, Frozen, Carrie Lynn talked about blessed are the peacemakers through the story of Anna and Elsa. They've done a great job, but I think both Hamilton and this particular beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, need to be looked at from a little bit of a different angle to really understand both the true message of the beatitude, at least in my opinion, and Hamilton. Put simply, there are facial similarities between Hamilton the musical and the beatitudes, but there is also a deeper, much more critical view that these two things offer us. And I humbly submit it will change the way that you both see Hamilton the musical and your approach to Christ's ministry. You'll hear discussion today about the Beatitudes. I've already used the word a whole bunch, uh, but I wanna give you a fresh reminder exactly what I mean in the context of the textual history of the Bible or the Greco-Roman meaning in the Bible. I think it really grounds the substance for what we're talking about today and the message and what Jesus was trying to get at on the Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes are the first nine blessed statements that are at the beginning of Jesus' famous uh, Sermon on the Mount beginning in chapter five, verses 11, the first 11 verses of chapter five of the Gospel of Matthew. And they're familiar to many. Blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the meek, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. And today we're talking about blessed are those who mourn. These nine pronouncements from the Gospel of Matthew are what are known as macarisms. And what does that mean, macarism? Well, the nine Beatitudes are called Beatitudes because in the English tradition, uh, they were translated Greek to Latin, and the Latin word was beatus, which means happy, blissful, fortunate, or flourishing. And from there, the English translated beatus to blessed. Beatus, beatitude, blessed. That's pretty easy. In the original Greco-Roman Greco translation of Matthew's gospel, the original word was makarios. That's the Greek word. And why is makarios important? Because it has a distinct and important meaning that was, that's known to biblical scholars and theologians, not necessarily to everyday folks. It should be. But, and it gives rise to what is called a makarism. A makarism is defined as a statement that describes happiness or flourishing to a particular person or state of being. That a certain way of being in the world produces human flourishing. We know this because the Greek translation of the ancient Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament translate the, word, the Hebrew word esher as makarios. In every instance, esher is translated as makarios. There are other words for blessed or blessed, but 
Esher is in particular translated as Makarios. 45 times in the Old Testament, most of them in the wisdom literature found in Psalms and Proverbs. And in every instance, Esher is always followed by and connected with the, the uh, always followed by and connected with who is being described. So Esher is the one who, or Makarios is the one who, or blessed is the one who. And Esher was a proto-Semitic or Egyptian root word that meant something probably along the lines of prosperity, good luck, happiness. And it embodies the concept of referring to true happiness and flourishing in the covenant of God. That's the Old Testament meaning of Esher translated to Makarios. And then Matthew's gospel uses the same word, Makarios. Esher is the one who, Makarios is the one who, blessed are the ones who mourn. This is important because it's a direct link to Jesus' ministry in the gospel to the scriptures and the ancient Hebrew traditions in the Old Testament. This is how Jesus really fires off the beginning of his ministry with the Sermon on the Mount, and he leads the sermon with nine distinct macarisms. Importantly, he sets the foundation of the most influential, important words of his most important sermon with macarisms that tie ancient Jewish wisdom tradition to his own presaging of the new covenant that we are to live into. It's foundational to his ministry, and I believe that they can be viewed as foundational statements for who we are, who we should be as humans, to bring the kingdom of heaven as we want it here on earth now. So keep that in mind as we pro progress through today's message. The Beatitudes or this collection of macarisms at the beginning of the Sermon of the Mount are foundational links to Jesus' ministry and ancient Jewish wisdom tradition and that they begin and really launch his ministry. So now let me, let me take off my professorial tweed jacket and put on my Hamilton fan shirt because we're not here just to talk about the ancient Greek translations of words and Hebrew. We're also here to talk about Hamilton, the 2015 smash Broadway hit that was based on the rather large 2004 biography by Ron Chernow. It's a, a musical about the $10 founding father of another immigrant coming up from the bottom. His enemies destroyed his rep. America forgot him. Hamilton on its face is a story about the founding of America. Hamilton is also foundational in that it sets forth a democratic story about the founding of and the foundational principles of this great American experiment that we celebrated yesterday on the 4th of July. It's a stirring and wonderful masterpiece of Broadway music that tells a moving and touching story of personal achievement, historic nation building, tragedy and in individual and family loss, and redemption in remembrance. If you've not watched the movie version, which was released on July 3rd on Disney, or seen a traveling production, or been fortunate enough to see the New York production, I highly recommend you try to find a way to see some version of it, because it is truly an amazing musical feat. The musical set in the years immediately preceding, during, and after the Revolutionary War. Hamilton immigrates from the Caribbean after the death of his mother and the abandonment by his father. He's by all accounts a genius polymath but he's viewed with skepticism because he's an immigrant. A brilliant mind that could write and orate on virtually any topic, but he wanted to prove his worth by fighting for his country. So he joins the Continental Army. He fights well, he impresses George Washington and eventually gets picked to be his right-hand man. Spoiler alert, America wins the Revolutionary War. And ultimately, Hamilton goes back to New York to become a lawyer he begins to work on the U.S. Constitution at the Constitutional Convention, and then he begins to be Washington's Secretary of Treasury, where he fashions great compromises in government with Southerners like Thomas Jefferson for a national debt plan and a central banking system that would enable America's nation state to endure to this very day. Of course, it wouldn't be a Broadway musical or a stirring story if there weren't other storylines. It's interrupted if at times with a scandalous love affair and a temporarily ruined marriage. It's interrupted by the loss of his son in a duel. The storyline of America is also punctuated throughout with the personal rivalry of Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton from cordial friends at the beginning of the play to bitter political enemies resulting ultimately in the death of Hamilton in a duel. 
It's a lot of history packed into a two-hour musical production. And Lin-Manuel Miranda will tell you he's, it's not 100% accurate. You couldn't put all of this in two hours without taking some artistic or poetic license. But it goes, does get the larger brush strokes of American democracy and the foundational story of America right. At its core, Hamilton is, a, is exactly that, a foundational story for who we are and who we want to be. So in this very superficial way, the Beatitudes, there's an obvious similarity between Hamilton and the Beatitudes. They're both foundational and they both set the stage for something more. But Hamilton and the Beatitudes are both something different. They're more than just feel-good storylines or comfortable statements that God is going to care for people. Hamilton, in particular, is the story of America juxtaposed against a counter-narrative of embedded systemic racism found in the founding of our country. A counter-storyline or critique that is both subversive and raised implicitly in the production of the musical itself and the choice of particular storyline emphasis. And to me, anyway, this is where the real genius of Hamilton lies. When we think of Hamilton and our founding fathers, we think of fiercely independent men that stood up to the tyranny of a monarchy that is out of control. But we also know, we know that these founding fathers were affluent, they were white, they were slave-owning. And Hamilton's musical production creates an intentional cognitive dissonance between what we know to be the history of America, revolution led by powerful white colonists with a cast that is made up entirely of people of color playing those founding fathers. Washington is played by Christopher Jackson. Jefferson is played by David Diggs. Aaron Burr by Leslie Odom Jr. Eliza Schuyler by Philip Sue, Angelica Schuyler by Renee Goldsberry, Hamilton by Lynn Manuel Miranda. They have brilliant performances, all from people of color playing famous white people. But that's not the only implicit structural critique that's in Hamilton. The one major white character, white actor, is playing King George III, Jonathan Groff, from Frozen Kristoff fame. He is playing the tyrant that is being overthrown. This is not an accident. And besides the casting choices, both the music style and the lyrics create a decidal, decided critical counter story. The musical has plenty of traditional soaring Broadway anthems, but they are almost all infused with some influence from America's African-American black hip hop and rap culture. The lyrics themselves repeatedly focus on themes that run contrary to the founding story and the principle of equality and liberty that we think of when we traditionally celebrate America's founding. Hamilton's an immigrant. His character, though, is besmirched in part because he's an outsider, from a not from a place of privilege or wealth. But the musical itself recognizes the importance and the achievements and power of immigrants in America when Lafayette and Hamilton high five before the Battle of Yorktown and say the now famous phrase, immigrants, we get the job done. There are cabinet battles that are done in explicit rap style between Hamilton and Jefferson in which the fight over slavery and inequality is front and center. A clear issue with any musical about the founding of our country would have to address slave owners, and Hamilton does not shy from the fact, in fact, he brings it up often. In the cabinet battle where Hamilton is debating Jefferson about the debt plan, Jefferson claims the importance of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to justify denouncing Hamilton's debt. He claims, don't tax the South because we got it made in the shade. In Virginia, we plant seeds in the ground. We create. You just want to move our money around. And Hamilton's retort, a civics lesson from a slaver. Hey, neighbor, your debts are paid because you don't pay for labor. We plant seeds in the South, we create. Yeah, keep ranting. We really know who's doing the planting. It's particularly impactful because Jefferson was a slave owner that constantly preached about freedom and claimed to have hated slavery. But it disrupts the master narrative that we have in our mind about the founding fathers in U.S. history. There's a third cabinet battle, actually, in the original Off-Broadway production that's on the mixtape. And in that same rap-style battle, Lin-Manuel Miranda raps and calls out Jefferson for his relationship with Sally Hemmings and even notes George Washington's ownership of hundreds of slaves. The inclusion of these conversations in a story about America's founding 
in the democracy ideal that we really try to live up to disrupts the reproduction of structures that have maintained that sanitized narrative. But they do so in a brilliant and energetic way that still pays homage to the exact ideals that we want. This is critique. This is counter storytelling at its very best. It explicitly shatters the complacency that we have when we think about our founding. The genius of Hamilton is not just in its dance choreography or music, but it in a ways it challenges us with radical and subversive messages, all while delivering all of those in the best way possible, a masterpiece Broadway musical that still reinforces the values that we cherish. It challenges each of us to look at our past and to live into the new future, living up to the cherished values. And this is exactly the type of messaging that Jesus Christ's Beatitudes provide us. They're not just, the Beatitudes are not just a laundry list of obvious aphorisms about God caring for the impoverished. Of course, on its face, it's exactly what the Beatitudes are. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Of course, God would comfort those who experience loss. But is Jesus really setting the foundation of his greatest sermon and the launch of his ministry on a simple observation that God will be there for you? No, the Beatitudes are subversive and revolutionary in their own right. Think of the historical context where Jesus was preaching. First century Judea, a time of oppression and marginalization for almost all of the Israelites. The common Jewish male or female would have been they would have been subject to two powerful ruling classes. On the one hand, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who would have controlled virtually every aspect of their religious and social order. The existing priestly classes often enforced social hierarchy and economic classification based on an adherence to the law that would rule large swaths of the population ritually unclean at time, unable to participate in society as we know it. But the people of Judea were also ruled by empire, the Roman Empire, an oppressive and crushing and brutalizing occupying force that controlled every other aspect of those living in Judea. Tax collectors were hated because they worked for the empire. Centurions were hated because they would force random Jewish citizens to carry their packs for a mile on a whim. There was a growing zealotry movement at the time of Jesus' ministry to actually revolt and overthrow the Roman Empire. It would ultimately take place years after Jesus' death. But it's in this context of empire and control that Jesus turns the markers of favor on their head. The Beatitudes would have been contrary to every social and religious reflex of the status quo in Second Temple era Judea. The meek shall inherit? No, the powerful occupy and control. The poor in spirit receive the kingdom? No, the strong adherent and follower of the law is favored. And it's in this subversive, revolutionary context that we look at the phrase, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The beatitude is not just a simple statement of comforting in case of loss. It's a radical invitation to flourish by willingly and voluntarily entering into a state of suffering, a state of mourning. Jesus is commanding us to enter into the state of suffering so that we can make the change necessary now to truly grow into the kingdom of heaven on earth here and now. John Wesley, founder of Methodism, preached on this and said of the blessed of those who mourn. He taught that the call to mourning was a call to mourn our collective sin because it's through that recognition that we know to take action and realize the new normal of our realization. My personal favorite modern theologian and philosopher Dietrich Bonhoeffer he captured the idea of embracing suffering through a voluntary mourning, and he writes in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, by mourning, Jesus, of course, means doing without what the world calls peace and prosperity. He means refusing to be in tune with the world or to accommodate itself to its standards. Such men mourn for the world, for its guilt, its fate, and its fortune. The disciple community does not shake off sorrow as though it were no concern of its own, but willingly bears it. And in this way, they show how close are the bonds which bind them to the rest of humanity. There's textual support for this in the gospel and the ancient Hebrew scriptures. 
The Beatitudes are something more than mere value propositions. They're keys to human behavior that center actual human flourishing. Remember from the very beginning of our talk today, the macrisms and what that means for being in a state of human flourishing. The phrases uttered by Jesus in first century Judea would have meant something deeply personal to those sitting on the side of the mountain listening to him. They would have been a counter storyline to power and influence of the ruling class and empire that they desperately thirsted for. It would have been a reminder of the ancient Jewish wisdom tradition that true flourishing comes from a state of being that embodies these very values. So what does that mean for us today, 2,000 years later? It means in the words of Paul from Galatians 6, 2, that we have to carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. We must willingly engage in the mourning. We must embrace the suffering that comes with, law, with mourning. The act of mourning, the act of embracing suffering can be an agent for change. When my father died in 2012, I always heard from friends and from preachers at the time, you will get to a new normal, new normal, a new normal. Well, how do you get to the new normal? You mourn to it so that you begin to build a new life upon it. You mourn through it and use that mourning and that grief as an action for agency. Today we talked about Hamilton as a brilliant musical, but it's also a critique of systems that are dripping with racial injustice. And racial injustice is perhaps the perfect timely example of how to apply this beatitude to our lives today. Outside the doors of this church, that same racial injustice and sin hangs over our country. Christ's beatitude about mourning is a call to embrace the suffering in precisely these types of systems. Willingly enter and embrace the suffering of those who experience racial injustice. Listen to their lived experience. Feel their pain and mourn their losses. Ahmaud Aubrey. Blessed are those who mourn. Brianna Taylor, blessed are those who mourn. George Floyd, blessed are those who mourn. We say their names so that we can mourn, but not just mourn in the sense of favorable memory or loss, but mourn in the manner and method of Christ's beatitudes. Choose suffering so that we can have the compassion and the empathy and the resolution to change and flourish as humans. Both Hamilton and the Beatitudes offer us a choice point. We can see them on their face for what they obviously are, or we can see them for the deeper, profound invitation to change that they present. On the day after our country's Independence Day, I think it's appropriate that we call for a revolution of our thinking, a revolution of how we see the world, a revolution that Christ called us to 2,000 years ago so that we can truly flourish. And as Hamilton would say in the musical, don't throw away your shot. I want to thank Sean for that powerful message and timely message as we uh, do look toward a new normal. And a normal was uh, given to us. It was presented to us through the communion table when Jesus gathered his disciples of all different kinds of ways of life together at a table where they all joined together and they united in their own mourning. And we ultimately see that they were brought into the state of mourning as Jesus took on our mourning in the way that he would uh, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of the things we're sorry for. Forgive us of the mistakes that we've made on the cross and through resurrection, bringing us into a new way of life and a life eternal that sees each other the way that God sees us with love and with grace. And that is what we celebrate when we come to the communion table, a subversive, powerful action. Because who worships a crucified Savior? That's not power. But ultimately, we see that power comes in forgiveness, much the same way that when Eliza takes Hamilton's hand and says, forgiveness is what shows us what the world can look like and how we are to lead the world when we take on the presence of Christ in us and the work of Christ amongst us. So for those of you who have your communion elements at home, we'll, in a little bit, uh, you can dip those into each other, the bread and the, and the juice. You can dip those in together here 
in the worship space, we have our individually packaged communion elements, and we'll say this is the body of Christ in which you can eat that together, and then we'll say this is the cup of Christ, and then you can drink that together, and then we'll have the praise band who will lead us uh, in time of meditation and singing as we all come to a new normal uh, of what Jesus calls us to look like. But let us pray upon these elements now. Would you join me in prayer, whether you're at home, whether you're here? Let's all pray together. Holy Spirit, pour out your presence, your peace upon the gift of this bread and juice. Make the be for us here and around the world the body and blood of Christ so that we might be as a church and as your people the body and blood of Christ in the world. May we be united in your spirit, one spirit, committed to forgiveness, committed to grace, committed to seeing the world the way you see the world and a revolutionary new way of thinking. May we mourn today, Lord, as you did so long ago. And may we join together in that as we partake in the bread and the cup. And it's in your son's name we ask this blessing upon these elements here and in our living rooms. And it's in your son's name we pray, amen. So the body of Christ is broken for you. The blood of Christ is poured out for you. So let us take this opportunity to partake in Holy Communion together. Whether you be at home, you can dip the elements together. If you're here, you can eat the elements uh, and drink the elements. Know that the one thing I really want you to know is besides we have the communion offering for Harper Helper that you can go do, the most important thing is that here at the United Methodist Church in Creekwood, this isn't Creekwood's communion table. This is not the United Methodist communion table. This is the Lord's communion table. And so whoever you are, wherever you come from, if you have Jesus in your heart or you wish to have Jesus in your heart, this communion table is open to all people of all kinds of ways of life, of all different nations, of all different races. So let us take communion together as we all join in singing, come to the altar. Are you hurting and broken within? Oh, is calling Have you come to the end of yourself Do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling Oh come to
right, guys, we've got uh, one more song we're going to sing together. If you'll join us in singing Hands to the Heavens. Yeah. 
So I want to thank everyone for worshiping with us and joining with us, whether in person or online, no matter where you are, you're in the room where it happens as we uh, seek to not throw away our shot that Jesus gave us to really create the world that looks like the way God wants it to look. And so let us focus in on the forgiveness uh, of our mission as we go forth in this place to show the world what it means to love God, love our neighbor, and love ourselves. Amen. See you next week. Go in peace.